are you filing your green card application or your marriage-based visa application and you have gotten to the stage where you have to do an affidavit of support and you do not even know what that is, what you need to do, what documents you need to provide. Well, in this video, I'm going to break that down for you. We're actually gonna go through the affidavit of support form. This is one of the few forms that when you're filing for your spouse, whether they're in the US or outside of the US, you will need this form. So. In this video, I'm going to break down the form and just highlight the things that you really need to pay attention to and why it's so important to get it right the first time. I am Lillian Chukar, I'm a US-based immigration attorney and I help my clients get green cards and citizenships for themselves and their families using the US immigration law system. The affidavit of support lets USCIS know or lets the embassy know that you make enough income for your household size and you are able to support your spouse when they get their green card, right? If they are not able to work, if they are not able to support themselves, that you have enough income to support you too and anyone else in your household. So the form that you will need to prove this to USCIS or the embassy is the I-864. This is one of the only forms that's the same for a spouse that's in the U.S. and a spouse that's outside of the U.S. So the I-130, the I-130A, and the I-864 are the forms that are the same regardless of where your spouse physically is. So let's jump into the form so that we can go through and talk about the things that you need to pay attention to um, and the things that can really derail your case if you are not paying close enough attention this is the i-864 this is the affidavit of support form you must file this form when you are petitioning for your spouse the first step is showing who you are. So who's filling out the affidavit of support and their relationship to the case. So as the petitioner, you will select that you are the petitioner. You are filing this for a relative, right? And then down here, information about the principal immigrant. This is not the petitioner's information. This is the person that's going to be getting the visa or the green card. This is their information. It's really important that you do not put the U.S. citizen or permanent residence information here because, again, issues. So their name, their address, what country they are a citizen of, their date of birth, if they have an A number, if they have a USCIS online account number, their phone number, okay? If your spouse is outside of the US, it's okay for all of this to be for, um, if your spouse is outside of the US, the mailing address and the phone number is their address and phone number outside of the US. USCIS and the embassy understands this. So don't feel like you have to put your US address. They want where your spouse currently lives and what their current phone number is, all right? So here it's asking, um, who are you sponsoring, right? Are you sponsoring the principal applicant? You are always sponsoring the principal immigrant, okay? Because your spouse is the principal immigrant. So you're always going to be sponsoring the principal immigrant. If you are a permanent resident and your spouse has children that you are also filing for at the same time or that will follow within six months, then you want to select um, those family members and make sure that you include the information for those family members. All right. So again, this is for permanent residents filing for spouse and spouse has children. If you are a U.S. citizen, your spouse, even if there's other children, cannot the children cannot follow to join. Okay, it's really important that you know this. The children cannot follow to join. You have to file a separate application for each child as a U.S. citizen. So for U.S. citizens, there will be no family member to put here, okay? So you will put the family member if there is family members. And then you'll total up your principal immigrant plus any family members and put that number here. 
And then over here, you will then put your information as the sponsor. It is, it is um, a little backwards where they're asking for the immigrant's information first and then the sponsor's information. So just make sure that you are putting that in the right order because if you don't, again, delays because this will not be accepted unless it is filled out correctly. So. You want to make sure that you are including your full name, your mailing address. Um, if it's the same as your physical address, then you just select the right option. And then up here, if you have a different physical address from your mailing address, you'll put that here. Here you want to put your country of domicile, which is where you currently live. Not where um, you may want to be, but where you currently live. Do you live in the US? The answer to this, nine times out of ten is yes if you do not live in the u.s please reach out let's talk about it because that can affect your um, visa application for your spouse okay you need your date of birth your city of birth your state of birth country of birth your social security number this is really important. This is one of the few places it says required because USCIS wants to make it clear to you that you must include your social security number if you are filing an affidavit of support. If you have a joint sponsor and they do not want to put their social security number, that joint sponsor is not going to work. Okay, you need to make sure that your joint sponsor includes your um, social security number or your case is not going to work. Okay, they will not be able to um, do an affidavit of support in your case. That's really important. Then next up, you have your citizenship or residency. You have to show if you are a U.S. citizen or a resident, you know, you want to make sure you include that because they want to know what category um, you or your joint sponsor fit into. Your A number, if you have one, if you are uh if you are a U.S. citizen that is born in the U.S., you do not have an A number, okay? If you have a USCIS online account number, you want to include that as well. If you have it, um, it is not required. Then if you are in the military, okay? If you are the petitioner, if you are the petitioner, this is one of the places I really like to highlight for people. If you are the petitioner, and you are in active duty military, okay, armed forces or U.S. Coast Guard, please say yes, because your requirements for income is going to be lower than anyone else's. So your income requirement is going to be low, lower because you are a member of the armed forces or the Coast Guard. So it's really important that you answer this so that you are being um so that your case is look, being looked at in the right category that's what you really want with all of this you want to make sure that you're putting the right information so that your case is looked at under the right category then down here is where you do your household size this is where people mess up <laughs> okay this is where people mess up they try to make it clear but it's not always clear all right so here is where you put the number of people, remember when we did the um, family size? At the end is the number of people that you're sponsoring. This is where you put it, okay? You put the number of people you're sponsoring. If you're a US citizen, this is going to be one, all right? Because you are filing for your spouse, got me? So then yourself is already filled in, your spouse, Again, you're already filing for your, if you are filing for your spouse, you do not count your spouse twice. So you would leave this blank. I have seen this mistake done. All right. You cannot, you should not put your spouse twice because then instead of a household of two, you will be a household of three. You don't want that. Okay. You want to make this as easy as possible for USCIS. Then they're asking if you have any dependent children. So dependent children are children that live with you, children that you support, and that are on your tax return. Okay, if you file taxes and you claim children on your tax return, those are your dependent children because for them to be on your taxes, you have to say that they are your dependents, right? All of this follows. So you have to um, really look at all of them. And then if you have other dependents, so parents, 
things like that, you know, people that depend on you, you want to make sure that you include them here, even though, even if they are not your children, they are your dependents. Then down here, if you have ever sponsored anyone, okay, if you have ever sponsored someone and they became a permanent resident, you need to put the number of people that you sponsored that are now permanent residents, okay? If let's say you sponsored someone, but they never became a permanent resident, right? They never got their green card. They never got their visa. Then you will not put them here. But if you sponsored them and they got their green card and they are still green card holders, you will put them here. If they have become citizens, they do not count anymore, okay? That's really the key here. Who are still permanent residents today? <laughs> um, if they already got their citizenship, they are no longer permanent residents, so you would not count them. And the reason that USCIS wants this is because they are included in your household size until they become a citizen. Okay, or until they have 40 quarters of working hours as um, indicated by the Social Security Administration. Right, so those are, the, those are the ways, okay? So you want to make sure that you are um, including those numbers here. And then if you have siblings, parents, or adult children that, you know, will be including their income to make up the difference. So let's say your income is not enough, but you live with your mom and your mom makes more than enough income and you want to include their income as part of your household, then now, even though your mom is not your dependent, you still have to include them as part of your household here. If you do not include them as part of your household here, you cannot use their income, okay? That's really important. If you do not include them as part of their household, you cannot then um, later on include them as household income. But they can file a separate affidavit of support as a joint sponsor without you adding them as a household member. But if they live in the same household, you might as well do that because um, it's going to be easier for you. And then at the end here, you will add up all of these and that will be the number down here. Now we get into your employment, right? As the sponsor, are you working? If you're working, what's the name of the employer and what is your job title, right? What is it that you do for this employer? If you have more than one and you do the same things, you can put all your employers. If you are self-employed, you want to put your occupation right? What do you do? So if you're a self-employed um, electrician, for example, you will put electrician, right? If you're retired, you will select retired and put the date that you retired. If you are unemployed, you will select that and put the date that you became unemployed. And then over here is your current individual annual income, not your household annual income, but you yourself. Let's say, let's say you're the joint sponsor and you file taxes jointly with your spouse. So the tax return has your income and your spouse's income. When you are filling out the affidavit of support and they ask for your current individual annual income, it is only asking for the income that you make. Okay, do not include your, this is not where it's asking you for your total income on your tax return. No, this is asking for what part of that income that shows as total income on your tax return actually belongs to you. That's what it's asking for, okay? And then if you, remember over here, I say you can include um, parents, siblings, adult children as household members. If you did that, then over here, you'll put the person's name, their relationship to you, and their current income, all right? They do need to fill out an I-864A in order to be a household member, not an I-864. So if you want to include them as a household member, they need to fill out an I-864A, really important, okay? You can have more than one household member included. So let's say there's like, you want to include your parents, your siblings, you can do that, 
That's really the important thing to remember here. You can do that, all right? So next up, a, so when you're doing this, sometimes it automatically calculates this for you, but if not, just add up all the current income. So your annual income, your household member's annual income and put it here. Um, if you are the joint sponsor, you're just going to put your income um, unless you are also adding your spouse's income as well or a household member's income to make up the difference. Then if you are if you are adding a household member, then you want to make sure that they fill out the I-864A and that you are selecting this to say that they have completed an I-864A and you are including that, okay? That's really important. You want to make sure that you include it. Um, if, this is, this is the other part, if your household member, so let's say your spouse that you're filing for has a work authorization through, let's say they filed for asylum before and now they have a work authorization through that. So they have legal employment in the US and you want to include their income, then you can do that without, right? If you two file together, you can include their income without having to file an I-864A. But anyone else other than the intended immigrant has to file an I-864A. So then if it is your spouse that has legal employment in the U.S., they're legally allowed to work in the U.S., you will check this box and put their name, all right? Um, and then also down here, this is another important part. Have you filed taxes for each of the um, five most recent tax years? Okay, three of the most recent tax years, yes or no? So if you have not filed taxes the past three years, you want to make sure you're selecting the right box here. And if you were not required to file taxes because you did not make enough income, there is a box for that and you just have to explain that you did not make enough income um, to be required to file a tax return. Okay, those are two different things. Just because you think you didn't make enough income does not mean you were not required to file a tax return. Two different things. So as you can see here, it says you must attach a photocopy or transcript of your tax return for only the most recent year. So it is 2024, the most recent year is 2023, okay? So in 2025, the most recent one will be 2024. So you want to make sure that you are, you know, looking at your dates and making sure that you are including the right ones here. So the most recent year, as of today, will be 2023, 2022, 2021. And you need your total income from your tax return. Now, if you want, right, it's optional. If you want, this is completely optional, optional. You can also include your second most recent and third most recent tax returns with your application. Your most recent tax return has to go with the application, but the second and third most recent do not. But if you want to include it, they'll take it, okay? You just have to check this box saying that you want to include it. And then if you were not required to file a tax return, um, you'll select this box and include evidence that says that you were not required to. And then over here is the assets. So if you do not have enough income, but you have enough assets, you can use your assets. I have a whole video where I break down um, how to use assets. So this is where you'll put those information. So savings account, checking account, um, real estate holdings, stocks, bonds, all of those things. You want to make sure that you are including it and then totaling, totaling it up. If you have a household member, like we talked about up top, that will be including their assets. Let's say they don't have income, um, but they have assets that they want to include. You still have to fill out that form I-864A, put the relative's name here, and the amount of their assets. The details of the assets will be on the form I-864A. So they're not asking for a breakdown of those assets here. If the principal immigrant, the person you're sponsoring, 
also has assets. You can go ahead and um, put those assets here. There are assets. So remember, if you want to include their income, they have to be legally allowed to work in the US. If you want to include their assets, there's no requirement of legal employment in the US in order to include assets because assets are assets, right? Um, they do not require you to work for them. And then over here, you will basically total up all the assets, okay? All the assets from you, your, you know, household member, your intended immigrant, so the person you're filing for, you total that up here. And then that's about it um, for filling out. The next step, this is a contract. <laughs> USCIS, the US government, the US government wants you to know, the US government wants you to know that this is a contract. This is a contract between you and them. All right, you are saying that you are willing to sponsor this person. It has legal effect. They can sue you if you um if they want to recoup any funds that this person um that you're sponsoring at any time gets government assistance. Okay, it's really important. Okay, so they want you to they put that right in here that it is a contract between you and the government. So if you are, let's say, the joint sponsor, you may wish to consult a lawyer on your own. Um, what I, you know, when we're working with a joint sponsor, I do not advise them on whether they should or should not be a joint sponsor, right? We can complete the forms, but they have to get legal advice somewhere else. <laughs> Right, I do not give them legal advice because I'm representing the petitioner and their spouse. So when it comes to a joint sponsor, my office will probably prepare the forms and they have to go and make the decision of whether they want to sign it or not and enter into this contract or not, okay? So I do not advise that, you know, I do not advise them of the consequences and all of that because I am conflicted out. Okay, because there's a conflict of interest there because the people that they're going to be sponsoring are my clients. So there's a conflict of interest. So I cannot advise them on this point, but I will tell them to, if they have questions about it, that they can meet with another lawyer to get answers. Okay. But I cannot provide those answers. So please read it completely. Make sure you understand, please. <laughs> Make sure that you understand what it means and what you are signing. If you do not sign it, okay, you can choose to not sign it. If you do not sign it, then you can't submit it, all right? Um, other consequences, they really want to break this down for you, okay? The person should not be on any means tested. Um, benefits. Government can sue you to recoup. Do they do that? Sometimes. <laughs> Not really, but it is a possibility. So you have to enter this and look at it as a contract, okay? Now, there are things that do not count, all right? There are things that do not count. So school lunch, things like that, um, medical treatment, school, right, elementary and secondary school. So if they are going to public school, that doesn't count, right? Um, if they are getting emergency Medicaid, okay, short-term non-cash emergency relief. So things like that will not count, but let's say they're getting cash assistance, that may count, right? Um, and then your obligation, if you do not, fulfill your obligation, right? They can sue you. <laughs> In lack of better words, they can sue you, okay? So I always want to read this so that you know what it says. If a federal, state, local, or private agency provided any covered means-tested public benefit to the person who became a lawful permanent resident based on a form I-864 that you signed, the agency 
may ask you to reimburse them for the amount of the benefit they provided. If you do not make the reimbursement, the agency may sue you for the amount that the agency believes you owe. If you are sued and the court enters a judgment against you, the person or agency that sued you may use any legally permitted procedures for enforcing or collecting the judgment. You may also be required to pay the cost of collection, including attorney's fees. All right. So that's why, <laughs> that's what this is, right? That is the contract that you're entering into. And then when does your obligation end? Another great question. They tell you when the person becomes a U.S. citizen, when they have credit for 40 quarters, of coverage under the Social Security Act, the only people that can confirm that is the Social Security Administration. The person is no longer a permanent resident and has departed the U.S., or the person is subject to removal um, but applies for and obtains in removal a new grant of adjustment of status. So let's say the person gets their green card, they did something, they end up in immigration court, they're able to get a green card through another means, not the I-864 that you filled out, but a different means, then your I-864 obligation ends. Or if the person dies, your obligation ends. So yeah. Oh, most importantly, because people always ask me this, divorce does not fix it. If you divorce the person, your obligation is still there right? The contract is still valid, whether you're divorced or not. Contract is still valid, all right? So that is the form. You sign it and you're done. Um, as always, for my clients, I am signing this as the preparer and I am taking... Um, as always for my clients, I am signing this as the preparer because we prepare your forms for you. We go through it with you to make sure that there's no nothing that needs to be changed. And we confirm every single thing that you put there because we're looking at your tax returns and um, bank statements if you are self-employed. We're looking at all of those things to make sure that this is filled out completely and accurately and you can move on to the next stage. All right. Now, let's talk about why it's so important to get it right the first time when you fill out this I-864. Well, if you are filing a green card application in the US and your I-864 does not have the right information or your income doesn't actually meet the requirements, you're going to get a request for evidence. And guess what? While you're waiting to respond to that request for evidence, your case is not being processed. It's basically on hold until you do this. And that includes, let me tell you, that includes your work permit application, okay? Your work permit application is not going to be processed unless USCIS accepts your I-864. If they have issues with the I-864, everything is on hold because you only qualify to get a work permit while your green card application is pending if you meet the basic requirements for it, including the I-864 being um, accepted, all right? And then if you are at the embassy stage and you are uploading your documents, you are not going to be in line for an interview if there is an issue with your affidavit of support. Yep, everything will be on hold until you finish that, submit it, and it's accepted, and then you will be in line for an interview. So however long it takes you to respond and to put the right affidavit of support on the platform for the visa application, that's how long it's going to take before you can be in line for an interview. So getting all these forms done correctly the first time is what's really going to help um, move your case along. And remember, if you are watching this and you are a little scared to do this on your own, don't be. Go ahead and reach out to me because we can help you with your affidavit of support and your entire green card process. So go ahead, schedule a strategy session with me so that we can discuss how I can help you and what steps you need to take. And also discuss whether you qualify on your own for the affidavit of support. If you need a joint sponsor, we can determine all of that for you. 
If you would like to schedule that strategy session, feel free to go to my website, lilylegal.com and click on contact us and you can select a date and time that works best for you for us to speak. You can also call my office at 508-443-1788 to schedule your consultation.